And then the mom and dad, the number one thing parents need to ask their kids is, A, are you happy? A, are you happy? Because parents are trying to forge this path and supportive path that you can't Google how to figure out. Like our book is the only thing out there right now, but how do I become a parent of an elite recruit, let alone a walk-on recruit? And when we saw that white space, we're like, we gotta help. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am super fired up to be joined by the one and only Yogi Roth. Uh, Yogi, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today, man. Yeah, hey, show up and show out, baby, right? Just like it says <laughs> in your t-shirt. Uh, thank you. It was cool to see how your process is, or at least observe it from afar, of how you book guests and what you've done on your platform. And uh, you know, not really knowing you other than what I've read, you could tell you're a motivational and motivated entrepreneur who's probably got a lot of interest, man. So I'm excited for wherever this conversation goes. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. So I'm one of the things that I get super fascinated about with certain people is kind of the trajectories of their career. And I get super fascinated with careers that are not very linear and your career, you've done so many different things and it's super fascinating the breadth of things that you've done and also kind of the depth that you've done certain, what certain numbers of those things at, but the way I kind of want to start is, you know, you were at, at University of Southern California after you got your undergrad at Pittsburgh. You were there getting your master's for a couple of years, and while you were doing that, you were on Pete Carroll's coaching staff, uh, his, his football coaching staff from 2004 to 2009. At what point and why did you kind of make the transition to wanting to do broadcasting? Yeah, for sure. Um, I always like to say Pete took the clay that my parents created and shaped and he really molded it. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was there, you know, as a launching pad, still is kind of for assistance. Our guys were kicking off every year to get head jobs or go to the NFL or get promotions. And every year you'd think about going to do that. And something in my gut was always like, nah, stay, stay, stay. So I kind of stayed as long as I could. I did four years as, as you referenced there and got to be around Pete and Sark and Lane Kiffin and Guys have just impacted my football life and my personal development in a, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, with that said, I fell in love with the craft. I fell in love with sleeping in the office. I fell in love with everything about college football and coaching, the relationships, everything. But as I looked to Pete and older coaches like Pat Rule and guys that had really been in it for 30, 40 years at the time, I was like, I don't know if I want to know what the next 30 years of my life are like. And I was 27, I think. And I live in Hermosa Beach. If you've ever been to California, you know what Hermosa Beach is. It's magic. And for a kid from the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania, it, it was probably times a million in that regard. And I just said to myself, like, I love this craft, but I don't know if I want to know what my next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years are going to be like. I wanted some more unknowns. And, and I get that there's unknowns in coaching and where you're going to go and jobs and the fluxation of all that. But for me, career-wise, I just wanted... I wanted to see what else was there. You know, football had been my life forever. And I knew I was at a pinnacle place. And I turned down, I remember at the time, it was like 100 grand to go be the quarterback coach at Washington under Steve Sarkeesian. And just something in my gut was saying, you got to go see the world. And mm -hmm. I got on a plane and I just went and saw the world. And I think as I was traveling, what I recognized was I love football. Yeah, I still do. Football is what feeds me you know, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and also literally. And I, I never want to leave that, but I didn't want to throw down 365 24 seven and sleep in the office. I wanted to do 365. Or I wanted to do like 180 24 seven. So you give me the season, half the year broadcasting, as you referenced, then the off season, how can I tell another story in sports that lights me up, maybe can inspire other people can connect me to a different group of people than the 15 people on a so-called coaching staff at the time. And that's, that's why I left. And it was hard. And I, I feel a pull all the time to go back. But I found places where I get that coaching itch, whether it's in Europe, I'm working with a football team in Paris, or the Elite 11 and quarterbacks, or I just wrote a book called Five Star QB with connecting me to that group and community again. So I'm finding ways, nothing will be like coaching, but I ended up had, having to leave because that's, that's really what my instinct was telling me to do. Yeah, well, I think there's a number of 
good things that you that you did when you were kind of going about that decision making process is you had the self awareness around your level of desire when it comes to certainty versus uncertainty. And I think a lot of people need to develop that self-awareness with regards to that balance of certainty versus uncertainty because some people want a lot of certainty with their jobs. They want to know what exactly their schedule is going to look like. They want to know exactly what their salary is going to look like. They want to know what it's going to look like for the next 10 years. And some people want crazy uncertainty and a lot of people want somewhere in the middle. So if we can have that self-awareness around where our tolerance level for is for that, then it can be really beneficial in our decision making. And then another thing that you did that you were able to do because of the role that you had is you were able to get a very clear picture of what the day-to-day looked like for coaches and get a really clear picture as to what your life actually could look like. And you're like, you know what, this is fun, but I don't want the practicality of what all of that looks like. And that helped guide your decision-making a lot as well. Yeah. And I think also like when you're that age, you know, when you're in your twenties and you have somebody like Pete as your mentor, and you're not losing, you know, we've rarely lost. I think we lost like four games in my whole time there in four seasons. Yeah. Maybe not, I don't even know if that, that's the, the right, right number. Um, you just think you're going to win forever, you know? And I think you can also lose perspective on the craft. Like I did not know what trajectory a coach was on at USC. Like I saw Lane and, and Steve Sarkeesian like launch off to the Raiders head job or Washington's head job. But I never really even looked at it like, hey, like you're kind of in that same, you're, you're in that same lane. Who knows what would have happened? I think for me, it was all like, I was like, man, I'm 26, 27. I want to see the world versus like, hey, if you hang on for another three or four years, like you might make enough money to see whatever the heck you want, you know? And I, and I don't think I even thought that way. My brain wanted to even go in there. I was kind of in the moment of, I want to surf every day. I want to make a movie. I want to see the world. And like, I kind of had that, Spirits, I think to your point of like the awareness, I didn't have anywhere near the awareness I have today. I think I just had like what I I think athletes always have is you you have this instinct to follow a love and a passion because you fall, you fell in love with the sport and and you have to have instincts to play sport at a high level, right? Whether it's spin move, you know, jump shot, you know, be this guy at the line of scrimmage as a release, as a, as a wide out. And, And I just had to trust that. I had no clue at the time that it was going to lead to. 17 years in broadcasting and 20 films or a couple books. Like it was just kind of like, I kind of want to go to Brazil right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I, I, I got, I got to see the globe. And I think athletes sometimes, if you don't take a break, and that's why I love companies like Nike, for instance, they give a sabbatical. It's pretty radical, right? Like for somebody you do a decade there, they're like, you got to take time off. And I think for athletes and coaches, you usually just kind of fall right into it. You never take a minute. And for me, taking that time in retrospect was dramatically beneficial to just my overall growth as a person. But I'm glad I listened to my gut because if I didn't, I feel like I'd probably be, there's a part of me that would have regretted not seeing what that left-hand turn would have done. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I think trusting our instincts does not lead to a whole lot of regret. You know, a little somewhere, but I don't, and it might be the wrong path, but it might not be, lead to regret. So I think, I think that's pretty insightful. Now, one of the things that again I kind of mentioned in the beginning, you do, you've done and do so many different things. You mentioned a lot, a lot of the films that you've done. You've written a number of books. You're a broadcaster. You're a speaker. You do all these things. You call yourself a storyteller. Um, practically, how do you keep things organized in your brain and focused? And, and separate out the different things that you're focused on. Because obviously to achieve any level of success or greatness in any of those things requires a deep level of focus. So I'm just I'm just curious, practically on a yearly basis, monthly basis, weekly basis, daily basis, what are the, some of the things that you do to help separate some of the things out and allow you to maintain a high level of focus? Yeah, that's a cool question. Um, I think when you're getting into entertainment, and, and I, I, I don't know if this is like that in other walks of life and other professions, but definitely in entertainment, you try to, you often get put in a box, right? An agency will say, okay, you're uh, the, in the host lane, you're in the sports lane, you're in the analyst lane, you're in the actor lane. And, and most of the times I think creatives, we, we blur, like we're artists, mm-hmm. you know, and, and not like necessarily artists that's like 
throwing paint against the wall in Spain, like uh, in Vicky Cristina Barcelona or something that's coming to my mind. But in like, you, you have different places where your creativity leans. And, and I've always felt that. And I've also felt the strain of like, he's in a box. And I think athletics often are so rigid and they kind of have to be. You have to have parameters, boundaries, strategy, structure, all those things that to achieve success as a competitive athlete. And I'm down with all that. I think as I expanded outside my playing career, I was like, well, I got a bunch of creative interests and I want to play in those sandboxes per se. And I kept finding others being like, well, that's not, that's not your box, Yogi. And, and it bothered me so much that I can remember having a conversation with a guy named Jeremy Darlow, who I'd recommend you have him on your show. And Jeremy is a marketing guru who's written a bunch of books. And I went and spent a bunch of time with him, a guy named Ken Black, who I'd recommend, and Kevin Carroll. And those three guys really shaped this part of my life. And, and Ken and Kevin are my biggest mentors in my life now. But basically what we tried to figure out was like, okay, I need a marketing statement. I need an analysis of like, what is the market that I'm in? Where's their white space? And then what's my positioning statement? That's what old school marketing would say. What's your positioning statement? And really what I netted out is the following is my job and what I love to do is to seek and uncover humanity and sport around the globe and specifically <clears throat> in the fall college football that's what i'm about so whether it's a speaking gig is it seeking is it uncovering is it about humanity is it in sport is it global is it college football is it a book does it have those attributes is it a meeting is it a zoom call is it a podcast like everything goes through so it's actually pretty tight for me Mm -hmm. And I think it took me a long time to say that. And I'll never forget the first time I said that statement, I was at South by Southwest on a panel at the you know, event in, in Austin, Texas. And they kind of go down the line, they're like, introduce yourself. And people can kind of go on and on because people do amazing things. And I was like, hi, my name's Yogi Roth. And my goal is to seek and uncover humanity and sports around the globe and in the fall, college football. And it was a mic drop moment for me, at least in my own mind, between my own ears of ah, clarity. Clarity, every opportunity, a scripted movie, a documentary series, whatever goes through that lens. And if it can't, it's out. So, so that's really been a vehicle for me. And then when I present myself to buyers, agents, whomever, it's allowed me to have a stronger voice than like, I like writing, I like performing, I like college football. And, and then you're all over the place and, and nobody understands what you're really about. Yeah, no doubt. It's, it's kind of... Um... To an extent, a, a North Star that helps guide your decision making. I think for so many of us, it's important to have kind of that, a similar sort of statement. Everybody's is going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be the, as, it's not going to be necessarily like yours if somebody has like a regular nine to five job, but I still think that it can be important for everybody, whether you're an entrepreneur, or you do your own thing, or you work for a company. I think it can be really helpful to kind of to define the purpose behind what you do, because I really feel like it can definitely help guide decision making and help you say no to certain things that don't align with whatever that positioning statement is. Um, I love the concept of five-star QB. I have not had the ability to read it yet, but basically you've been doing elite 11 for a number of years now. And year after year after year, you kind of were realizing that both the recruits and the parents of the recruits were continually asking all a lot of the same questions. And the reality of the situation is, is when football players go into college football, there's no blueprint for how you should act. There's no blueprint for how parents should a parent their their kids and so you guys wanted to be able to create a guide that is essentially like a series of mentors for both the recruits the college athletes and, and their parents as well so I want you to kind of talk about some of the top principles from the book maybe like two or three principles from the book and do it both from the like player standpoint around a lot of the principles that they need to understand well before going into college sports and then a couple of the principles for the parents as well that they need to understand before their child uh, embarks on that career or opportunity. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing it up. I, uh, I have it in front of me. And the reason I, I want to show the cover here is not for the natural PR, but if you can see it, it's the faces of the quarterbacks. And when we were creating the cover for this book, Joey Roberts, co-author and myself, kind of like, what, what should it look like? And we had a bunch of mock-ups, you know, as you do when you're figuring out a cover for a book and, 
it just hit me really strongly of like, it needs to be the faces of these players. Because if you're a fan of, you know, you live in Nashville, so you could be Vanderbilt or Tennessee or, you know, SEC school, what, what have you. Or you're from Atlanta, it could be Georgia Tech or you know, UGA. And you hear about a quarterback committing your school. First thing you probably do is you look up what's his ranking. Oh, five-star quarterback, four-star quarterback. Okay, cool. Let me see his highlights. Let me see his social media. You never take the helmet off. <clears throat> if I did this with a college football fan who considers themselves a legit college football fan, and I said, let's play a game. There's 54 faces on this cover. Tell me who everybody is. I bet they'd be 50%. You know? Yeah. Honestly, and I bet sports writers and broadcasters and hosts of sports report shows, they'd be even worse than that because we just see them in their armor, right? And then we judge them on that armor. And what we learned to answer your question for the players is that not one of them ever rose their hand and said, hey, hey, name me a five-star quarterback, please. I want my life to change and I want everything that comes with it. They were just playing ball and all of a sudden somebody said, you're the best in the world this year. And I think at first they all were like, dope, let's go. And after that moment, it was like, whoa, why is everybody picking me apart? I'm not, I'm not perfect. Why do I have to be? And then when they get to college, because now they're playing with grown men, they're like, oh, I, I'm not as good as so-and-so said I was. Damn, how do I navigate that space? And in the last 20 some years, which is what this book is based on, uh, ratings started in, in 1999. And now here we sit 23 years later. So up, this book has people up into Caleb Williams, who just won the Heisman, and Bo Nix, who was just up for the Heisman. Uh, uh, you know, players, players of that of that ilk, um, guys that were just freshmen a year ago is, is basically where the book cut off. And they all said, like, man, I, I didn't really have a process of how to manage this. So the point of whole, writing the whole book is that being at the Elite 11, as you said, which is think of American Idol for high school quarterbacks, the best in the country come every year and have for over 20 years. They all ask the same questions. And now with social media growing and recruiting growing and NIL growing, where athletes can get paid and often get paid off a ranking by somebody else. They're like, how do I navigate this whole world? So what we try to talk to the players about is getting to the core of their story because they can't change how somebody views them or what someone ranks them but they can alter the story in which they want to tell about themselves versus letting others pen it. So there's a lot of the work that, that I'll do at the Elite 11 with the guys off the field with our team of, okay, like, let's dive into like, what's a character trait that you have? Mm -hmm. And do you feel as though that's being shared? And if not, the microphone gets put in front of you. What's a skill and style in which you can share it? And then I think the other one for the athletes is front-loading mental skills. You know, it's a huge part that what I talk to coaches about now, what I talk to families about and athletes about is front-loading mental skills. Mm -hmm. Meaning when life is bad and I get benched and I get destroyed on social media, hey, I need to go talk to somebody about it. That's amazing and that should happen. But what if that was the first thing we did? You know, a good friend of mine is a guy named Dr. Michael Gervais, who's a high-performance psychologist. And he would say, you can train three things. You can train your craft, throwing the ball, your body, we understand that and your mind. And everyone in the world understands that the mind is a big part of performance, but how much do we train it? So I say that to the athletes. I'm like, how much are you training those skills? And then the mom and dad, the number one thing parents need to ask their kids is, A, are you happy? A, are you happy? Because parents are trying to forge this path and support a path that you can't Google how to figure out. Like our book is the only thing out there right now, but how do I become a parent of an elite recruit? let alone a walk-on recruit. And when we saw that white space, we're like, we got to help. We have to help. You know, so much so I talked to parents and they're like, well, my kid's really good, uh, but he's not playing. So we're thinking about transferring. My kid's really good. We're thinking about holding him back a year in seventh grade. My kid's really good. We're thinking about reclassifying as a junior in high school. And I say, okay, well, is your son happy? Yeah. How are his grades? Good. Does he have friends on the team? Yeah. What's relationship life with the staff? great. Well, when did it change anything then? Yeah. And I think right now that, that that's what I would answer the second part of your question. That's what I'd tell parents. Ask them that question and then finish up with this. Ask them when they look in the mirror, do they like the individual looking back? Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard for men like you and me. I'm 41. I don't always like the man looking back. 
right? And if I was 16 and everybody was telling me who I was and what I was, or I was 18 or 20 or 22, it's hard. You know, Caleb Williams said that in his Heisman speech. And I thought it was the most profound moment I've heard in the Heisman. And I've been going to the Heisman for over a decade now covering it. And I was like, okay, mom and dad, I talk to parents all the time with the Elite 11 of, if your son's looking in the mirror, does he like the man looking back? And if he doesn't, it's on you to help him, not help him transfer, not help him get held back, mm -hmm. not help him get a scholarly, help him in the moment. And it's hard. And I have a ton of empathy for parents because you're, you're trying to like figure out the future. Damn, man, you can forget about the actual present. And that is, that's a real, that's a real thing and a real threat, I think, to the mental health and growth of junior high and early onset high school student athletes. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. I I love those questions. Are you happy? And then all the other, are you relationship with your coaches? You have uh, good connections with the people on the team. All of that was so good. When you look at the man in the mirror, do you like the man looking back? And then that last part, I think, is so critical for a lot of different reasons. When you talked about how oftentimes parents can be, with the best of intentions, looking forward, but sometimes forget about the health and the happiness of, of the person or of their child today. I really think that one of the top leadership qualities, if you're leading yourself or if you're leading somebody else or your parents are leading you, is to try to simultaneously find the appropriate balance of caring for the current version of the person and also the future version of that person. I always kind of use the example of my parents. My dad was maybe the parent of the two who cared about the future version of Nick, while my mom is the one who she'll give me the hug and is always there to say things are great. But when my dad comes to my house, he'll ask what's wrong with the roof and point something out. So he's looking at after future version of Nick, but mom is looking after current. Now they do both have a balance. But I think like I think that's super important for both leading ourselves and leading other people and obviously parents as well. Yeah, Nick, that's um, what you said, and you chuckled about it with your mom and dad. But in all the studies that we've done, it's kind of the role that mom and dad in a two-parent household take on. And even if the parents have split up, separated, divorced, um, it's still the same. Mom is safe space, caring about the present. Dad can be about the performance and the outcome. And a lot of the influence that have become on myself and Joey and the research writing this book has been for parents after after games to not ask like, hey, how did you play? What did you think of the game? Even how did you feel? It's more of like, it's really exciting to watch you go do what you love with a smile on your face. Mm -hmm. And what's cool is that like, I have a seven, almost eight year old and an almost three year old. And yeah, you know, they're just tape, you know, case studies you know yeah and i and i screwed it up hey how'd you feel when you hit that ball right and and i found success it's really, it's really fun to just watch you smile with your teammates and then boom it oh it, it's an unlock it's an unlock to different conversation and and men and women while stereotypical uh in their roles there are facts and when you talk to college coaches it's the same deal what does mom want to talk about what does dad want to talk about and i've, I've so many examples from this book that made the book and a bunch that he didn't even make the book where the parents lived that exact archetype of dad mm -hmm. pushing and pushing and pushing, not realizing it, mom supporting and supporting and supporting, but not saying anything to dad. And who's caught in the middle? And I think when you are struggling as a performer, whatever the performance is, but specifically football, when your external reality, your friends, your family does not meet the internal reality of your teammates and what the film says and your coaching staff does, you'll never maximize your potential. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I appreciate that insight there. Uh, I want to get to a, a couple more questions here with the time that we got left. I really find that all of us in our lives have to deal with managing expectations and no one no one more has to deal with expectations than a five-star quarterback, right? They're looked at as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old as they're going to be the next big thing. They're going to be the next Tom Brady. They're going to be the next Aaron Rodgers. And there's just massive expectation placed on them. And we all experience that to certain degrees. A lot of times we get high expectations from our parents, high expectations from our bosses, high expectations from our significant others. Talk to us about how we can appropriately manage expectations because we can't control the control the expectation, but we can only control how we manage it ourselves. So talk to us a little bit about how we can swiftly 
manage expectations appropriately. We'll be back to the interview in just a second, but first I wanted to share some words from a participant of the 10-week transformation. At Best U, we started running the 10WT back in January of 2020 and have since had 313 people and counting go through it. They've seen their bodies get stronger than ever before, they've seen the stubborn fat finally come off, and they've seen their habits dramatically improve. And honestly, more than anything, they've seen their self-confidence skyrocket. If you want to learn more about the 10-week transformation, then you can go to nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. That's nickcarrier.com slash the number 10WT. We'll get back to the show in just a second, but first, here's what they had to say. I have completed Nick's transformation program twice, and I'm gearing up to start my third. I have seen more and more progress every time I complete the program, and not all of it is just physical. I would say the two best parts of the program for me have been... um, First, Nick has taught me how to really prepare my week to overcome the type of obstacles that everybody is up against when it comes to trying to maintain our health journeys. And then the second being that during really chaotic seasons of life, it's helped me to prioritize my health. Uh, The workouts are really fun. We do new stuff every time you walk into the gym. And I've been involved in group fitness classes my entire life. And the amount of energy that Nick brings is completely like unparalleled. It's so much fun. I love it. So if you're thinking about doing it, you should, you'll be glad you did. Yeah. I think if you're a high school athlete, it's different than if you're a fully developed adult brain, Mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I think if you are the high school athlete, um, what's your systems in place around you? You know, I, I always will go to that like what's your coach like what's your team like what's your environment like and once i gain an understanding of that i think it's easier uh or smoother to be able to talk about that specific instance right if you if you're the only dude and you've only been the dude forever and it's not a team that you've been around with a bunch of elite players or a community that embraces you know other people's expectations and an understanding around it then i would say all right like let's Let's make sure that you get exposed to other elite performers in your life because right now you're the man. And when you leave your county or you leave your state, I, mean, I remember being told this, I was, I was a player of the year in Pennsylvania and I thought I was the man. And I remember somebody saying to me, you should go to another camp. And I went to Notre Dame and I was like, okay, well, there's like 49 other players of the year here at summer camp. Like it just changed the game. And I was young when I went and saw that. So that I I would say exposure is a huge part of that. Like once you hit a ceiling in your community, it's on the adults in the room, right? If you're not a fully formed, developed brain, Mm -hmm. which I don't think happens later, 25, 26, anyway, like get to go get exposed, right? So then you can elevate your standard. And then it's not about how everybody's telling you how sweet you are. And we see that on Elite 11 all the time. I mean, there's kids that come from the middle of nowhere that drop into LA or to Nike's campus or wherever we have the finals at. They're like, damn, everybody's good. You know, and you're like, yeah. So what's set? What's the separator, right? What's the separator? Okay, there's work ethic. Okay, cool. There's competitive temperament. Cool. But there's really like an intangible element, I think, around like being a seeker. Like, are you mm-hmm. curious? Are you naturally curious about anything and everything like do you have this insatiable desire to learn i think that's a difference man like you can't coach up somebody who's 250 versus 170 you can't coach up speed arm talent most of the time like but you can continue to develop like your quench your thirst <clears throat> for the craft i think as you get older dealing with expectations um it's acknowledging them accepting them and then moving through them. And, you know, I feel that as a broadcaster all the time. This is going to be the best game in the world. These, this matchup between cornerback and wide receiver. Okay. My job is to highlight that because everybody else is highlighting it. I don't know. Like I'll address it. If it becomes a flow of the game, let's talk about it. Right. Or even as a broadcaster individually, of like, oh, Yogi has this style. If I hear that from somebody, okay, cool. I acknowledge it. If I have to address it, Yes, you just even internally and then keep it moving. Because I think as you get older, you recognize that nobody really gets penalized for uh, prediction, you mm-hmm. know, and the prediction's often forgotten once the outcome happens, right? We can predict that the Super Bowl is going to be a one point ball game. Well, if it's a 30 point blowout and the Eagles win, 
we're just gonna talk about the blowout. We're not gonna talk about the, right. the prediction. And I think as you get older, you, you kind of get more comfortable around that. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, I like how you distinguish the difference between manage expe- managing expectations if you're a high school athlete compared to an everyday individual. I think that is uh, pretty uh, very insightful for sure. Um, but Yogi, before I ask the last question, I just want to acknowledge you, man. I want to acknowledge you for a couple of things. One, I think that your ability when you were back at 27, back at USC to identify that, yes, while I love the sport, but no, I don't think this is the way that I want to love the sport in my career moving forward for you to be able to identify that and kind of create your own path moving forward is super inspiring. And then I love how you take kind of the lessons that you've learned from the leaders that you've been around and the parents that you've talked to and and you're kind of trying to adopt the appropriate balance of caring for the current version of your kids and the future version of your kids. And I I loved how you talked about the way that you maybe speak to your son after one of his games about love, loving and watching him play and, and and smile and have fun, everything like that is pretty inspiring. Yeah. Thanks, man. I think a big part of that came from the research in this book, five star QB. Uh, Cause I did not realize that the numbers would be what they are. Meaning, over 50% of five-star quarterbacks. So five-star, the best. Not all scholarship quarterbacks, just the premier. Over 50% of them transfer once. Another 15, 17% transfer twice. Now we're seeing guys transfer three and four times. Yeah. Right? Only one won a Super Bowl as a starter. Stafford, year 13, team two. You know? Like, it's just hard to ever live up to that. And, and as a quarterback, as a five-star quarterback, it's like a can't-miss prospect. And everybody misses all the time. So I, I think mm-hmm. what we learned from this was like, man, expectations are great. And, and that's where I have a ton of empathy for parents. Like, I'm not going to be the guy that will shit on recruiting rankings or players making money. And I apologize for, for my language. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of guy. I love players making money off their name, image, and likeness. Uh, I love the transfer portal. I, I, I'm a huge fan of ratings because of the Elite 11. But what I'm not a fan of is the struggle that the athlete and the parent has to go through now. Like if I'm ranked really high, then that would say that I should be able to make a lot of money. But if I'm not that good, then how do I live with this reality of like, kind of know I'm not as good as that guy, but I got to grow my social media, but I'm really anxious on social media, but that's the only way I can really get paid. Like there's Mm. all these things pulling at an athlete and it's hard. And it may have been really easy until they got on a college campus. But the only guarantee is Chris Peterson often reminds me, as he would tell every one of his recruits at Washington, this is going to be the hardest thing you do. And it's not going to pan out exactly like you thought. Those are the only guarantees. And I think that's really hard to hear at 16 and 17 of like, you mean I'm not going to start as a freshman like Trevor Lawrence did? Tell me I'm not going to win a natty and win a couple Heismans and be Caleb Williams? Like, what are you talking about? I'm the same guy. I'm a five-star guy. And it's, it's very delicate to tell a premier quarterback, hey, bro, 51% chance you're probably going to transfer. <laughs> like, you don't say that. So All what right. do you do? You try to arm them with, a, again, I, lo- I love the phrase front load. Give them the tools to manage it. Because managing it is not turning off your phone. That's suppressing. Yeah. So I hope that what our book did and my time every summer with the top quarterbacks is just hopefully give them a tool or two to use when it gets hard because it's going to get really hard. That's awesome, man. It's definitely unchartered territory with the landscape of how college football is nowadays. And like you said, there's no playbook. There's no blueprint out there that gives people how to do it. But the five-star QB is going to be the closest thing that anybody has to that right now. So want to give you all kudos for putting that together. And if you guys want to go get five-star QB, then go get five-star QB. If you're a college football fan, uh, or if you have a son who is an athlete or, and honestly doesn't even have to be a, a recruit to a college team, just a, a kid who's an athlete, then go get this book, five-star QB. Make sure you guys follow Yogi on Instagram at Yogi Roth. And also, we had we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but he also co-authored a book with Pete Carroll called Win Forever. So if you're interested in going to get that book as well, Win Forever. But Yogi, last question is, I think that in order to get closer to the best version of yourself, there's both a constant journey and a unique journey. I don't think that we ever actually get to the best version 
of ourself. And I also believe that the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So the last question is for you personally, is if there are three things that you could currently do or currently work on to get closer to the best version of Yogi Roth that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Meditate more. Uh, I'd say outdoor fitness more. I currently am surfing twice a week. I, I'd love to surf four or five um, or some sort of movement. And then three is, uh, you know, we cut, we, in our house, we're having fun with my oldest son. We, you know, we talk about brain fuel and I'm like, it's not necessarily, um, you know, whatever video game his buddies are playing. I'm like, what, what do you, what is the fuel you're putting in? And we chart it throughout the week. I'm like, all right, what, what'd you think I'd do this week? You know? So I would say as an adult, as a dad, uh, more brain fuel on parenting. Uh, mm -hmm. I've learned that I, I wish if I could go back, I tell this to college athletes and, and they don't care necessarily because I say, man, I wish I took <laughs> early childhood development. You know, I wish that was uh, like, you know, when you find out your partner's pregnant, like that should just be required reading because you're kind of playing catch up and we're all figured out uh, along the way. But I have made it and my wife and I have made it like a very specific purpose at least once a week to put that brain fuel into our minds of like, OK, like where is his brain at? at almost eight years old what mm -hmm. can we try to get ahead of and, and you usually don't get it right um but i learned through sport you know good experiences average experiences way below average experiences in just youth sport of like okay i need to get ahead of this thing so i, I would say those three things meditate move and brain fuel on parenting those are three things that would allow me to be a better version of myself mm, i love that I love that last one, brain fuel on parenting. I I think that's so true, right? Every time so I can't relate specifically personally since I don't have any kids yet, but everybody's just trying to figure it out when, when it happens and, and trying to get ahead of it and, and, and get front-loaded skills would be very, very beneficial. But that's all we got today, Yogi. That was absolutely awesome, man. Y'all make sure you go follow him at Yogi Roth on Instagram. Go grab 5 Star QB. Go grab Win Forever. But Yogi, that's all we got today, man. Let's go. Thanks, Let's go. Appreciate <laughs> it. Show up, show out. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, sir.